I was thinking as I came over today that uh, amongst the good friends we had in the, uh, this institute, um, one of my pleasures in coming here on previous occasions was that Garrett Fitzgerald always said hello and sat in the front row and asked a very difficult question. Um, and I'm very sorry he's no longer with us. Um, I am, as uh, uh, the chairman has just said, uh, the Liberal Democrat in the Foreign Office. We are a coalition government in London, a very unusual thing for the British, which uh, some politicians and some media in Britain are still finding difficulty adjusting to. This means I spent a lot of my time inside government uh, negotiating on coalition issues um, because the heaviest bit of my uh, portfolio is in foreign policy and because Europe is one of the more difficult bits uh, within the coalition, I spend more time on, on Europe than anything else. Um, and in particular, I'm the Liberal Democrat Minister on the uh, little committee which, which oversees the EU balance of competencies exercise um, in which we are working through some 33 papers over two years looking in detail at uh, aspects of Britain's engagement with the European Union and asking the question, sending out for submissions for evidence, um, is the current relationship between Britain and the European Union in your area uh, to your advantage or to your disadvantage? Are you happy with the current uh, extension of European competencies or do you think they should be less or more? And um, yesterday afternoon uh, for my weekend reading, um, I received uh, draft papers on civil justice, transport, environment and climate change, and culture, media and sport on which uh, we will be negotiating next Wednesday. So that's the end of my weekend off. Um, and um, in the first round uh, in July, uh, we published papers on the single market uh, on foreign policy, including defense, on development assistance, um, probably the most positive paper we've had so far. The European Union does extremely well in terms of multilateral uh, assistance and certainly follows along with Britain's <coughs> objectives. Um, a good paper on health. I have to say, working through these, I, I, I reached the point of thinking, I used to think I understood how the European Union worked, but there were all these details that I had never quite understood before. Pharmaceutical regulation and the interest of the pharmaceutical industry, for example, um, uh, are things that I had not previously thought I needed to know about. Uh, on, there was a paper on taxation, which the British Treasury has deeply resisted opening up uh, questions about uh, EU competence in tax. Uh, uh, I'm told this is of some interest to the Irish as well. Um, and on animal health and welfare, a, a quite an interesting paper because the, the first draft of the paper which came through from the officials in our Department for an, an Environment, Food and <coughs> Rural Affairs um, carried the implicit assumption that the British national interest is represented by the food processing industry and farmers. And I and others had to point out that a lot of their evidence had come in from the British Animal Health Lobby. And the British Animal Health Lobby has had a great deal to do with the extension of European regulation on animal health and welfare. Uh, I suspect the European Union would not have got as far as it has in regulations on battery hens, on the transport of live animals, uh, and various other things, if it hadn't been for all those people in Britain who care passionately about that subject. As you well know, the British care far more about animal welfare than they do about <laughs> human welfare. We see the English do. Um, my, my message to you today is that Britain is not leaving the European Union. You should not believe everything which you read in the right-wing British press. Um, in January, David Cameron, our Prime Minister, uh, made a speech in which he started from the declaration that European community membership, continuing membership, is in Britain's national interest. 
and then went on to spell out a programme of multilateral reforms of the European Union, and I'll come on to that uh, later, um, which would make it more comfortable for Britain to remain a fully engaged member of the European Union and will also make it easier uh, for our government and for other national governments to persuade their publics that European Union membership is uh, in the national interest. And the second message I want to make to you is Britain is, is no longer, sadly, an exception in the European Union. The growth of national scepticism about the European Union is evident in France, the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, Austria, and many other countries as well. And we all of us face a shared problem of how we persuade our publics, particularly the older generation amongst our publics, the ones who vote most frequently, um, that European integration, international cooperation is heavily in our respective national interests. Uh, that's why democratic legitimacy is one of the high issues on our program. Um, the leader of my party, the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, made a speech last week in which he went a good deal further than our Conservative partners were able to do and declared that in next year's European elections we will be the party of in, in other words the party which argues the case for staying in uh, the European uh, Union. Um, part of the difficulty I know in following the British debate is that everyone else reads the British newspapers, or the English newspapers. And if you read uh, some of the English newspapers, you get the idea that uh, we are just about to leave, we are absolutely infuriated by Brussels regulations, um, and uh, the last thing we want to do is to stay in. Um, let me just remind you, for any of you who happen to have seen the Daily Mail recently, of how con self-conflicting these arguments can become. Last Tuesday, the London Daily Mail had as its main story, main front page headline, how the European Court of Human Rights was undermining uh, English common law and we should, without question, now leave. On Wednesday afternoon, um, the newspapers which are resisting the proposed Royal Charter on press regulation, that's to say the Telegraph, the Mail, and uh, the News Corporation, Murdoch Press, announced that they are going to appeal to the European <laughs> Court uh, against for, for judicial review against the proposed Royal Charter. Um, now, that shows a degree of incoherence, uh, which I, I, I rather like. Or, uh, or whatever, yes. The British debate is really on, on two levels. There is the detailed debate, sort of issue by issue, which is a reasoned debate, as we're seeing in the Balance of Competences Review. And we've had, so far, getting on for a 1,000 submissions uh, from various interested groups and expert groups to the review, um, which is talking about where our national interests lie in detail, um, where there are problems, where we'd like to see either less or more European regulation. And alongside that, there's a fundamentally different debate, which is emotional, um, passionate, and in many ways irrational. It's about sovereignty, independence, what sort of country we are, um, about, as it were, the betrayal of Britain. They actually mean England always. It, this is English nationalism in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and about the continent as a threat and Brussels as a conspiracy. And these two different approaches are reflected in the different interpretations of how Britain's future relationship with the European Union should be defined. Um, if you believe that we need to look case by case, issue by issue, in continuing negotiations with like-minded governments, then of course you wish to pursue a reform agenda, which is a multilateral agenda with others, um, in which um, you may uh, perhaps want the European Union to do more in some areas and less in others. Um, when Nick Clegg 
the leader of my party, was a European MP. He published a pamphlet, this is now some time ago, in which he said that it would be, what the European Union should do is to do less better, to be involved in fewer detailed areas, but to focus more effectively on the areas which are most important. This is a, a, a constructive multilateral approach. Um, and as I say, the, the balance of competence review is absolutely part of that. Um, the coalition government has built like-minded groups of other governments on a range of particular issues, and we hope to continue to do so on other issues as they are to come. For those who are emotionally attached to the idea of reasserting English independence, um, then it's a demand for unilateral repatriation, 27 against one, or rather one against 27, um, with the expectation, of course, that it may well fail, and with demands for a referendum as soon as possible, acting as code for saying we really want to move towards the exit. Um, this is, to some extent, nostalgia for an England which used to be more influential, which was able to tell Germany what to do, which was white, uh, which had a, a standing in the world which we perhaps no longer have. And if you look at those who are closely involved, there are elements of an English Tea Party about this. Those who uh, believe that the European Union is a conspiracy against the United Kingdom also believe that climate change isn't happening, and that is also an elite conspiracy, uh, that taxes should be cut without explaining what, where expenditure uh, will be cut. So it's a, it's a syndrome, if you like, in, in all sorts of ways. And again, this is not uniquely British. Um, the Dutch uh, right-wing party, uh, the National Front in, in France and elsewhere have similar conspiracy theories about the world. And when I read in my morning newspaper this morning that the Front National in France is now trying to, to build an international of nationalist parties, that seems to me to me the most wonderful contradiction in terms. You know, we'll hate you if you hate us uh, in, in comparison. Then we can all cooperate uh, together. Um, it, it is remarkable in all of this how little attention is paid in the London-centered debate, uh, either to the possibility of Scots independence, which would, of course, deeply affect the future of the United Kingdom uh, and our position in the world as such, or to the implications of the reassertion of this sort of British illusory independence for our relations with Ireland, North and South. Um, that needs bringing up much more actively in the British debate, and I would encourage you all, on all occasions that are, are open to you, to say that to your British colleagues and interlocutors, that Ireland has a major stake in the British debate, that uh, those who are arguing for a British exit have not thought through the implications for the relations with the rest of the British Isles, and that it is time that they did so. Um, the idea that we will somehow reassert English independence uh, if we leave the European Union is, of course, a little bit at odds with what British government is actually doing at the present moment, which is asking for the Chinese to invest more uh, in London and Liverpool, um, trying to persuade uh, the Indians to come in more, etc. So we are deeply dependent on the outside world, and indeed some of the foreign direct investors in, in Britain have intervened to say that the British need to recognise that there are economic interests at stake. In terms of British party politics, we therefore have a divided Conservative Party. Um, UKIP as the right-wing populist party, um, probably very popular for the protest vote, therefore possibly going to do very well in next year's European elections. Um, we don't know. My party committed to being the anti-UKIP party in next year's elections and a Labour Party which at the present moment is silent on the European issue and indeed did not mention Europe at all during their most recent party conference. Um, that 
brings us back to the issue, so what is the British debate? What is the British set of, of proposals for EU reform? That starts with the issue of flexibility, of how we adjust to an EU, which is now an EU of 28, and therefore much more complex than the EU of 9, uh, when the United Kingdom and Ireland joined, the EU of 12, with which we lived for many years uh, thereafter. The diversity of an EU which is deeply divided between North and South, East and West, rich countries and poor countries, is part of the problem with which we struggle. Migration from within the European Union is a difficult issue in British politics at the present moment, and it's anti-migration that drives support for UKIP even more than anti-foreigners, as it were, anti the German government or the French government. And the, the point next January when we will open uh, under free movement of persons uh, a residence in Britain less conditionally to Bulgaria and Romania will be a delicate issue in the British political context, which the right wing press will make a lot of fuss over. We welcome, therefore, the European Commission's refit agenda, looking at the accumulated acquis um, and cutting out some of the unnecessary regulations which the European com community has developed. Um, we also resist that part of the culture of Brussels which believes that the European Commission should always be producing new initiatives on almost every single subject. My favourite Commission proposal um, uh, until the hairdressers directive came along um, was that the European uh, Commission's uh, directive on uh, European sport colon the grassroots dimension. <laughs> uh, because of course the European sport does have uh, a, a, an EU dimension, but grassroots is not part of that if you believe in proportionality and subsidiarity. Um, the British have particular interests as a country outside the Eurozone in maintaining as coherent a single market as possible, even though we recognize that the Eurozone will need to take a number of additional measures on its own. And here we are particularly worried about the French approach, in which the French government has many within it who wish the Eurozone to develop its own much more specific uh, regulations, uh, possibly including a minimum wage has been spoken about at a European level, um, uh, its own different taxation system, etc. So keeping uh, alongside the, the redefinition of how the Eurozone is managed and making sure that that does not adversely affect the single market is an important British um, uh, objective. Alongside that, we want to deepen the single market and the entire digital single market is one which we see as particularly important, again, because there are British interests at stake. Um, we are, have now some very lively new IT companies but of course also because e-commerce is developing rapidly across the European Union. Um, tax avoidance and e-commerce is one of the problems that, that also uh, concerns all of us, and we therefore wish to see European regulation extending into that area. We want to see the European Union become more competitive. Here is an area where Mrs Merkel and David Cameron see absolutely eye to eye that the European Union has got to resist Again, I'm tempted to say the French government's view that the European Union, if necessary, needs to be more protectionist, and to recognise that uh, the European Union has to compete um, by uh, innovation, by spending more money on research, and by learning, therefore, how to compete with the Chinese and other Asian uh, countries. The Prime Minister this week uh, received a report on um, deregulation, in the European Union. Um, now, uh, all of us have a view on deregulation. Um, the regulations I like are very important. The regulations I don't like are unnecessary red tape, as you all know. Um, but um, it's clear, I think, to all of us, and the Commission is beginning to accept, that lessening the burden of regulation on small business will be a, an enormous benefit to all countries across the EU. 
So the, the, the better regulation uh, agenda, the less regulation agenda, is, is again something which we will be pushing for. Let me come briefly on to the democratic accountability uh, issue, and then I'm very happy to answer questions as, as, as far as I can. Um, we have all learned painfully that there isn't a European demos, that people don't feel European across 28 countries. And it's very striking in Britain that we are in some ways the most European country. We have 300,000 French citizens living in the southeast of England. We have a, probably six to 700,000 Poles. Um, we have large numbers of Italians, Spanish, etc. Um, and we are also, compared to our continental partners, astonishingly open in employment. Um, my, my wife and I went to talk to Lord Green, uh, the Trade Minister, uh, a, a few months ago, and Helen was rattling away to his private secretary in French. He has a French private secretary working in the Foreign Office. Um, I went, uh, my daughter works in the Treasury, and I went to give a presentation on the question, is there a European social model uh, to a Treasury internal seminar uh, last year, I was slightly horrified on arrival to discover that there was a Swedish member of the Treasury and a Spanish member of the Treasury sitting in the room. Um, we are very open. Uh, it, that's part of the, the contradiction of the British debate. Uh, you wouldn't get that in Berlin or in Paris or in Rome. So alongside this deep nationalism, there is also a remarkable internationalism in Britain. But the sense that Europe represents us and that we are well represented in Europe is not there, as it's not there in most other European countries. And we all have to recognize that the European Parliament uh, doesn't really provide the accountability which we want. So we are arguing strongly, using the terms of the Lisbon Treaty, that national parliaments need to use those uh, Lisbon Treaty arrangements yellow card, intervening uh, with the Commission, holding the European Commission and the Council of Ministers to account, and working with other national scrutiny committees of other national parliaments, with better coordination through Brussels, as a means of demonstrating to our national publics that national representative institutions are engaged in the evolution of European legislation and regulation. We think that's a good thing for Britain. We think it's also a good thing for a range of other countries. I was very glad to talk to the Irish uh, European Scrutiny Committee this morning, which is fully engaged in this. Unlike some weeks ago when I was talking to the chair of the Scrutiny Committee of one of the East European members of the European Union, discovered that he didn't, wasn't quite sure what a yellow card was, um, and that the idea that a, a, a committee of a national parliament should disagree with its own government was not very clear inside his head. So we have some way to go, but we are working on uh, building a greater national democratic accountability for uh, the European Union. And then, as, as I've already said, we are working also on our own balance of competences exercise. There are parallel exercises, more modest, happening in other countries. Some of you will have seen the Dutch government's review of Dutch uh, advantages and disadvantages uh, inside the European Union. Uh, we have had informal conversations with some other governments on much the same ground. We hope that the review will therefore contribute to the broader European conversation about the future of Europe, and we're very happy to hear further comments uh, from others across Europe on these issues. In the next round uh, of EU uh, balance of competences papers, there will be a paper uh, on um, aspects of justice and home affairs, and I very much hope that some institutions in Ireland, perhaps even the IIEA, may wish to contribute evidence uh, uh, on why uh, what the British decide on this matters to others, the common travel area, after all, being extremely important to us. Alongside this, the coalition government is engaging very actively, bilaterally, with a range of other governments. 
most of all with the German government, as we all recognize the German government is now key, I sit in a cabinet committee which meets every six months with our German counterparts. This is an absolute innovation for the British, um, but it's very useful. We have a sense we meet alternatively in Berlin and London, and we talk about uh, our shared agenda. Um, similarly, we are actively engaged in conversations with a, a range of other states. Um, I, I think that the Foreign Office team has probably visited more countries more often than any previous team in any previous government. We hope, therefore, that we are addressing the challenges that Europe currently faces, that we are staying fully engaged. We recognize that the European Union is changing and that as the Eurozone comes out of its current crisis, the Eurozone will also change. But we are engaged in continuing negotiations on how the European Union needs to respond to the challenges it currently faces. Thank you.